God. We thank you for the truth, God. The enduring truth, God. You cannot lie, God. We thank you for that, God. We just thank you for everything that you've done, God. We thank you for today, God. We thank you for Resurrection Sunday, God. We just thank you, God. You are risen today with power, God, and we thank you for that. You have all power, God, and we thank you, God. Thank you for your power, God. We thank you for the truth. We thank you for the word, God. The word that's alive, God. The word that changes lives, God. The word that changes hearts, God. The word that changes minds, God. That brings us closer to you, God. That cleans us up, God. That just makes us whole, God. That makes us apart from the world, God. That makes us one with you, God. So we thank you, God. We thank you for the word on
that I know him, hallelujah. Aren't you glad that you know him for yourself? Hallelujah, that you know that you serve a God, hallelujah, that loves you like no one else can. Hallelujah, that he loves you just that much. Hallelujah, that he said that he would die for us. Hallelujah, to save us from our sin. Hallelujah, that is love right there. Hallelujah, hallelujah, they beat him, they whipped him all night long. so grateful. Hallelujah for the love that he has. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm so glad for that love. Hallelujah. Put your hands together if you're glad for the love. Hallelujah. She is so into that. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to his name. Hallelujah. Amen. I know you guys are going to help me sing on today. Hallelujah. I'm already starting to lose my voice a little bit. But there's a song, hallelujah, that we sing that says, High and lift it up, and all the earth is who you are. Amen. So I know I have some sopranos, altos, and tenors out there. So if all of a sudden my voice stops working, amen, I know I can pass the microphone, right? Yeah. 
that wants to give a testimony or just to share the goodness of the Lord. Hallelujah. We want to give you an opportunity to do so at this time. Confusion of the enemy to work on pride through works. 
and it's just like anything else. The more you work out, you know, the better your body looks, the more you want to show off your body. And that's how religion works through pride. You know, you always try to look for ways to validate yourself so that you can stand before God and justify yourself. You put a lot of weight on yourself and the deliverance is different when you yield yourself to the sun. And I learned that through coming to being a true Christian now that wherever there's religion, there's suppression. You suppress all of your desires, but you're never delivered. And what, when you really put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're delivered from those desires. And if you keep trying to work your way back to sustaining something, you're going to begin to, your body resists it, and it creates the desire. So I say whenever you fall into those gaps of um, just feeling that doubt, you know that you're going to stand before the Lord in faith, not because you deserve it, it's because that, uh, that, that, that he died for you. And if you ever forget the power of the cross, you create a religion within yourself. So we know we're supposed to do good deeds and good works to stay away from sin. But I just say that from my own experience for 28 years of being in bondage, and your body always resisted. It's going to keep resisting you, right? And we just have to crucify that carnal man and just give our life to the Lord in faith. So just, the just will be justified by faith when you stand before God. Not because you've been so righteous or so holy, right. but because you believe that he was the one who saved you. That's why his name is above every name. Jesus is Jehovah, or God saves. So he, he's the Savior. So I just felt blessed to say that to everybody. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Anybody else would like to share on this morning and good night? Proclaimed on the day of Pentecost 
on the birthday of the New Testament Church, which includes faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, sincere repentance, water baptism by immersion in the name of Jesus Christ, and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost with the joyous experience of speaking supernaturally in other tongues, just as a believer did in the first century. We believe in living a life of holiness, both inwardly and outwardly, as a result of the working of God's grace in us. For the word of the Lord declares that all who name the name of Christ should depart from sin and separate themselves from the evil practices of this present age. We believe in practicing genuine Christianity through love for God and people, prayer, obedience to the word of God, heartfelt worship and expressive praise, sharing our faith, commitment to our marriage companions and families, availability to help one another in time of need, honesty and diligence in our employment, honor and respect for our government as it submits to the divine plan for human society, and the dedication of our time, talent, and treasure to advance the kingdom of God on earth. We believe in the local and universal church established by our Lord as a unique and special fellowship for all who believe is a spiritual community ordained for worship, stewardship, and service to God and people, of which every believer must become a part, for it is the body of Christ in the world today, displaying the same miraculous power and spiritual gifts experienced by the early church. We believe in the return of Jesus Christ, that glorious appearing, when our Lord shall come with the sound of a trumpet, when both those who have died in Christ and those who now live in Christ will rise to meet him in the air to be with him forever. We believe in the judgment of all people. When the wicked shall receive their punishment and the righteous shall receive their reward, we believe in the ultimate triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. At this time, I'll turn it over to our Pastor Blackman, amen, whose birthday is today as well. All glory and honor to Jesus. Can we just lift our hands and give him praise? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Glory to the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, God bless you, you can be seated. But we do give thanks and praise unto God, amen, for being here today. We thank God for uh, what he is doing in each of your lives. Um, I'm old school, so I appreciate um, devotional service and testimonies because we overcome by the word of our testimony, by the blood of the Lamb. And there's something about us sharing what God has done for us individually that's able to inspire and connect with someone else in a way that's very tangible and that's very important. Um, last week we spoke about boldness. How do you remember that? Boldness. Yeah. Amen. It is so important for us to be courageous um, in our testimonies, courageous in our sharing, because somebody's life is impacted by your story. And in fact, the devil is trying to keep many of us silent and keep us from sharing what God has done for us. But if you get like the psalmist and say, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. And in doing it together and in worshiping God and in, and in um, lifting up and giving glory to his name, all of a sudden something contagious begins to happen. Somebody who might have been um, a little bit concerned, somebody might have thought, he would never do it for me. When they hear that somebody on their row or somebody in their church, that God did it for them, all of a sudden they start saying, you know what? May, hallelujah. Maybe God will do it for me too. Hallelujah. Maybe if I believe God, then all of a sudden God will do it for me too. And in the process of believing, then they believe. And then as they believe, God begins to manifest. Thank you. And as God begins to manifest on their behalf, all of a sudden, they start testifying. And they tell us what God has done. And then the cycle starts all over again. And you look up and next thing you know, we're having a whole revival. Because all of a sudden, one person is telling another person. We used to sing in old school, you can't tell it. Let me tell it what he's done for me. Then we say, I get joy when I think about it. Hallelujah. 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 What he's done for me. I'm trying to contain myself, but I am happy for what the Lord is doing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I get joy when I think about it. Hallelujah. And joy is the antidote to so much of what ails our world today. Hallelujah. We don't just need happiness. We need joy. We need something on the inside of us that will sustain us 
And you know it's crazy. When you get joy on the inside of you, it doesn't matter what, what people are saying, what people are doing. Stuff that should have you depressed all of a sudden. Something starts to bubble up on the inside of you. And you start, you start smiling when you shouldn't be crying. How your hands start going up. All of a sudden, you might lift your hands and start worshiping God. That happened to anybody else here besides me? Don't let me think I'm crazy. Sometimes it happens when you're in the car by yourself. And you begin to think about some of the stuff that you're going through. You're like, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do. Hallelujah. But then all of a sudden, you get a flashback and a memory of what God did for you before. And as you remember what he did before, you say, you know what? I know God can do it again. And you go from being down and sad and busted and disgusted to all of a sudden having faith and belief and trust and strength. And next thing you know, you encouraged in the Lord. You're like, you know what? I'm going to get through this. Next thing, I I'm going to be victorious over this. There's power, hallelujah, that's helping and that's assisting me. And I am a, I'm a witness of the power of God. I'm a witness of the power of God. Um, if this was simply a book, I would not waste your time. If these were simply cunningly devised fables, I would not waste your time. I would not waste your time like this. We would not drive hours to get here just to, just to, to spread lies and to spread rumors. But there's truth in this. There's truth in this. And there's power in this. Yeah. And there's something authentic about this. And I know it sounds crazy, but if you just believe the word of God, yeah. Yeah. it'll do something in your life. It'll yeah. do something in your life. It'll do something in your life. It'll do something in your life. It'll do something in your life. Because the word absolutely works. It'll do something in your life. It heals sick people. It'll do something in your life. It, it, it heals the sick. It, 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 if, if you have a, if emotional issues that you're dealing with, it will fill the void. I'm telling you, the word of God will do something in your life. Even when it comes to little stuff like finances, it, it'll do something in your life. As you trust God, as you believe God, it'll do something supernatural and phenomenal in your life. And I am witness of these things and we are here because of the testimony of authenticated witnesses that went to a place where someone should have been still dead. Right. Thank you, Jesus. The common conclusion is that he should have been where they left him. But despite that, they go to where they thought he was and he's not there anymore. And I want to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the empty tomb. And I want to celebrate the, your own personal experience where people went to where they thought they left you. And people went to where they thought you should have still been stuck. But if you go and you look beyond the stone, you'll find out that you're not there anymore. Can you testify to somebody tell somebody, I'm not there anymore. I'm not where I used to be. You left me for dead. You left me for whatever you thought I was going to be. I'm not even sorry to disappoint you, but I must inform you. I don't live there anymore. I don't live there. Somebody needs to give God praise for that. I don't live there. That's not where I am. That's not my address anymore. I don't live there anymore. God has done something for me. Resurrection power. Hallelujah. Took me from where I was and brought me to where I am. And the journey continues. How many people know that? The journey um, continues. The journey continues. I'm still moving. I believe this. Can you just declare to your neighbor, greater is coming. Greater is coming. I'm say it with power. Greater is coming. Greater is coming. It's coming. Greater. Hallelujah. Greater is coming. Greater is coming. Greater. Yes. Hallelujah. It's coming. Greater is coming. Greater is coming. You have to learn how to effectively position yourself in faith. Brother Elijah, I salute you and honor you. Thank God for you. Um, the just do live by faith. It is according to faith. Our faith sets up for us the, our world and our reality. Um, through faith, we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God. So as we believe and as we trust and as we depend and as we expect, we begin to see the, re the reality or the realization or the manifestation of what faith can do. And I am 
utterly convinced of a number of things, um, that faith is one of the most powerful things. It is substance. So I can say that legitimately. Faith is one of the most powerful things that the world has ever known. And I also say that for the believer, faith is one of the few things that we can still count on and believe in and rely upon. And I say that with our object and, of course, the subject being God. Because I think that what God sometimes does for us is that he eliminates the crutches that we become so accustomed to. And it's not that God does not like you. It is not that God is not <laughs> that God is picking on you, but it is that God is trying to stabilize you. Because oftentimes what we lean upon, what we trust on, upon, although it has worked for a little while, uh, it's not as stable as we think it is. For those of us that are uh, putting our trust in currency and in money and in jobs and all these sort of things, jobs are good to have. It's good to be employed. It's good to work. And it's good to bless the Lord as a result of what you have received. And we tithe off of what we receive, all that kind of good stuff. But at the end of the day, God does little things just to remind us that, no, it's not the job, it's me. God reminds us. Every once in a while, I don't know, it's really crazy. Something comes up that doctors cannot figure out. Every once in a while, doctors come up with stuff. Your doctors um, end up encountering things, I should say, um, that don't have pragmatic solutions out of their physician's desk reference. And they look to you and they say, I don't know what else I can do. But here's the awesome thing. Just because they ran out of options doesn't mean that God ran out of power. And so oftentimes in those situations, that's exactly when God steps in, that your trust might not be in the doctor, the physician, or in medical science, but ultimately, although God can use these things, ultimately, my trust is in God. And so many of us in the past year have gone through the reality um, of a virus emerging um, in our world, in our society, that touched and impacted and affected us in ways that we could not have predicted a year ago. And yet what we are learning is how to trust and to depend on the Lord. Amen. And so I, I wear the mask, but trust me, my faith is in God. Right. <laughs> Don't get it twisted. <laughs> my faith is in God. I don't mean to scare anybody, but I don't know. I don't necessarily believe that viruses are so big that they can't fit between little fibers. I don't believe that. But the truth of the matter is I do believe in God. Yeah. Amen. I believe that God is able. Amen. And God is willing. God is assisting us. Amen. And God is keeping us even till this day. We are praying for those that have been impacted. Amen. Um, by the sickness and prayer for those that have lost loved ones. Let's continue to keep them in prayer. This season has not been easy for everyone. Amen. And we need to acknowledge that and be prayerful and supportive. But this is where the church starts to shine. Amen. This is where we're able to give encouragement and support to those that need us most. Whenever darkness is in the world, that's not when the church goes hide and say, oh, it's dark out there. So that's when we start letting our light shine even the more. And we start being impactful in that regard. On the book of John, chapter 15, the book of John, chapter 15, as you're paging there, we're praying, Father, in Jesus' name, this is your word, we give it back to you. God, we don't live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. Now, Father, will you speak to us? God, open our ears, touch our hearts, let us be hearers, and let us be doers. In Jesus' name, God, that which I fail to grasp intellectually, I pray that you would bypass me, Father, and minister to the souls and the spirits of your people. In the name of Jesus, I pray for the pronouncement of victory over every curse of the adversary, every, over every dominion and domination of spiritual forces that are antagonistic to your kingdom, to your will, and to your word. Father, I pray, O oh God, that we will see supernatural display, God, of your power. I pray, God, that we will be transformed and never be the same again. In Jesus' name we pray. People of God, say amen. amen. So there I was reading in John chapter 15, just like you will be doing in a couple of moments, recognizing that this um, discourse is perhaps one of the most, actually one of the longest, and perhaps one of the most personal discourses of Jesus to his disciples. Sometimes I guess I can be a little bit nosy, and so I feel like I am a fly on the wall listening to Jesus have this very intimate conversation with his disciples. 
beginning to share with them things that were not readily apparent and preparing them for days that were coming that would not be easy. In John chapter 13, we see now before the feast of the Passover, uh, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them to the very end. He begins to talk about Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him. He rises from supper, um, takes a garment and um, to his girdle, and he began to wash the disciples' feet. And from then, we have this introduction of what many of us would call the Last Supper, or this intimate, remember, that meals in biblical times are intimate. You just don't eat with just anybody. And there was a time we just didn't eat over anybody's house, right? Gotta be careful. And so the fact that he's eating with them indicates a certain level of intimacy. And that's why when he goes and eats at the publicans or the sinner's house, it was such a big deal. Because like, how in the world could you go eat with them? And so his eating with the disciples, of course, is an underscoring of the intimacy that they now share. And they are celebrating this Passover meal. What's weird about it in John chapter 13, though, is that um, as he greets them, I would have expected to see a servant there, but it's Jesus there. And it's him that actually is washing the disciples' feet. And he begins to, and this is not, you know, we do the ceremonial washing, right? Where sort of the expectations that people wash their feet in the shower at home, then they put on nice little socks and shoes, and then, you know, we get to church and we do the whole feet washing thing. Um, but in this time period, people were oftentimes wearing sandals that were exposed to the elements and the dust and all those sorts of things. And so when you actually wash feet, the water was actually dirty in the process, right? And it was really a literal washing of the feet. And it was generally the task that was assigned to the lowest man on the totem pole. It's a, it's a servant duty, and yet Jesus is there, and he's the one that's washing the disciples' feet. It's a timely reminder for all of us that there is no job that is beneath us as Christians. If you need us, if you need us to help you, if you need assistance, okay, this is the time when we step up and say, you know, I, I, whatever I can do, however I can be of assistance, if I have to carry you to Jesus, if I have to rip off a, a, a roof to do it just to get you to him, I do what I have to do. There's nothing that's too beneath me for me to be able to do it. Jesus then pictures himself. He represents himself not just in words but in deeds as a servant. And he serves them. He says, I have given you an example that you might now do it to others, that you might serve one another. And let he that is greatest among you be servant of all. Now, that is diametrically opposed to what we see in the worldly system. People try to climb to the top so they don't have to serve people anymore. So they can become um, those that are served. But in the, the, the kingdom economy, um, the last become first and the first become last. That makes sense to anybody. Right? And so it does not matter what people may say about you in the world in terms of, oh, you're just to this, you're just. When you come into kingdom, you are a child of the king. When you come into the kingdom, you are a child of God and you have status, amen, in the kingdom. Does that make sense to anybody? Status in the kingdom. And so he begins to wash their feet. Um, as he's doing so, Judas Iscariot, of course, will make his departure. Jesus will indicate interesting words. What you do, do quickly. Right? Y'all can go check me out and proof text me if you want. He says, what you do, do quickly. Um, and then um, there's this whole conversation, and of course, that transpires. Because Jesus says that one of them will betray me. Like, is it I, Lord? Is it I? Is it I? Before we become, for Judas will leave and say, is it I, Master? Is it me? Right, and all of them try to figure out which one it is. Judas knows that it's him, and yet he is the one. He's like, well, whoever will stop with me? Oh, look, Judas is here. <laughs> he it is, etc. And so we have this weird thing that's going on with the disciples, and there's this, there's this very, very strange and eerie sentiment. It doesn't feel comfortable. We've been traveling with them for about three years at this point. There's something that's really off. There's something that's wrong. Jesus keeps dropping these hints, and you know, we can be real dumb when it comes to stuff that we don't want to acknowledge. You know, the, the truth can be there, staring us right in the face, and we'll ignore it 
And a number of times already, Jesus begun to indicate that he's going to die, that something bad is going to happen. And they're having a really hard time recognizing what to do with this information because it does not fit into their framework of what their version of Christianity, even though it's not called that yet, what it looks like. It doesn't fit with the narrative. It doesn't sound right because if Jesus is going to be Messiah, then he's supposed to give us victory. And this victory does not look like what you're describing. And some Sometimes I struggle because what Jesus shows me does not look like what I want it to look like when we said we we're going to start this victory journey. Sometimes victory from the outside looks like defeat. Sometimes life looks like death. Does life looks like looks like things are just upside down. So y'all were laughing and smiling. I talked about the last shall be first in a topsy-turvy way that, that leaders become servants. But you've got to recognize that in the kingdom, so many things just turn upside down from the way that you, the way that you see it. You can't trust your mind. You can't trust. You cannot trust your logic. You cannot trust your intellect because it will fail you every single time. This is why the just have to walk by faith and not by sight because what I see will deceive me. What I see will make me really frustrated with God because it does not make sense, but it's not designed to make sense to my mind. It's designed to make sense in my spirit because I'm not really a citizen here anyway. My citizenship is really in heaven. And although I'm standing behind a podium on the earth right now, if you could just peer into spiritual reality, you'd recognize that I'm seated with him right now in heavenly places. And things look a whole lot different from heaven than they do right now. And I begin to see the perspective of what they, that's why the book of Revelation gives such comfort to Christians because it allows us after that in Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 where, that, where the, the, the voice says come up hither and John is able to be transported to the throne room of God and begin to see what's happening on the world. From heaven's perspective, could it be that one of our challenges is that we have not learned how to effectively look at things from heaven's perspective, we're still looking at it from our own perspective. God, help me to look at it through the lens of your word. You've got to change. My, my whole mindset has got to change. The way that I approach life has got to change. The way that I approach problems has got to to change. It's all got to be different because I've been born again. I've been regenerated. I've been born anew. And with a new birth comes a new perspective and new realities. It is not merely that I have reformed some behaviors. It's not merely that I've repressed some things that I used to do before and now I don't do those things anymore. No, I am absolutely different. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He is a new creation. I am something different than I was before. And so I've got to struggle now with this reality of what is truth and what is right. And my own eyes deceive me many times. My own eyes deceive me. My own friends deceive me because those that are carnal cannot receive the things that be of the spirit because they are spiritually discerned, said the text. And so I've got to be careful who I receive advice and wisdom from because not everybody can see what I see. They're not trying to be rude. They're not trying to be ignorant. They're not trying to be haters even. They just don't see yeah. what I can see. They're blind to it. They just don't have the recognition of it. God just has opened their eyes to it. If ever they could see what I see, then their perspective would be different. So that's why they handle things the way that they handle things, because it's all about the way that they see. But when I see differently, I recognize that the weapons of my warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rules of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. But those that are not spiritual cannot even see who the enemy is. You can't even see the reality of who the adversary is until you are spiritually awakened. And so Jesus says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nonetheless, enter it. He cannot even see the kingdom 
The, by the time we get to John chapter 15, then Jesus already in the previous chapter told us about the comforter. He told us that he would not leave us comfortless, but that he would come unto us. Go back, you'll see it. Um, Philip will say that, you know, you've been talking a whole lot about the Father. He says, show us this Father. It suffices us. Jesus says, have you not, have I not been with you so long and you still don't know who I am? So there's another level of revelation that the disciples have to have because they saw him as a man, but they didn't really fully understand his deity. They didn't fully understand that he was also God, fully God and fully man. It says, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. John chapter 14, previous chapter, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John chapter 15 says, I am the true God, and my father is the husband man. Those words simply mean that he is of the vine. He is not a fake vine or a false vine. We're talking about the true vine here. He's a true vine. And the father is the vine dresser or the gardener or the one that takes care of the vine. And I feel like I have a little bit of perspective because, you know, I actually did have a grapevine for a little bit of time. Just a little bit of time. Just enough. I don't know. It says, every branch of me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Interesting Greek word there. We'll come back to that. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. The interesting thing, and as I was reading that, I said, God, help me to understand what's going on with this branch in you that beareth not fruit. Because it's in you, and it beareth not fruit. And how could it be in you, and beareth not fruit? And we ought not get that confused with verse 6 that says, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. And I said, that can't be verse 2, because verse 2 says they are in me. Verse 6 says those people are not in me. Y'all reading this along with me? I know it sounds like advanced Bible study. I'm sorry. So then you have to go back to the Greek and find this word taketh away and see how it's used in the text. And in some instances, you'll find that when it says take away, it says they were lifting up their stones to cast the stones. They just lifted up his eyes. And so the primary definition of take away is actually not take away. The primary definition of this word is to lift up. If you know anything about horticulture, then you know anything about vines, you know anything about grapes, which I feel like I know just a little bit about because I did it for a little bit of time out there in the country. Even though rabbits came and tried, but we're not going to talk about that right now because I'm over it. I'm not triggered by that anymore. Mm -mm. Nope, not me. That, there's, that, that in order for us to be successful in having grapevines and producing grapes, the more that the vine is exposed to the sun, the more fruitful that branch becomes. But if it is, if it is um, under shade and things of that nature, it's not able to be as productive. And so what the text is indicating is that the, the grape vine dresser takes care of all of the branches that are connected to the vine. All you've got to be is connected to the vine. And if you are fruitful, then he will determine that it's not only purging or pruning, but also cleaning is used there. He will cleanse and he will prune back as necessary um, those branches that are productive, but even the ones that have not arisen to the level of productivity that are connected to the vine, he will lift them up that they might be exposed to the sun and able to enjoy the privilege of producing fruit as well. Does this make sense to anybody? And so therefore there's these things called trestles and sometimes they line them up um, above uh, on um, on trees, even sometimes, in order to allow the vines to crawl up, because the vine is actually lifted up, its propensity for success in producing fruit is increased. Does that make sense to anybody? Yeah. 
Now, I know that many times when people recognize that you're not producing what they want you to produce and they don't, you don't seem to be meeting their quotas, et cetera, many people will throw you away and cast you aside. But aren't you happy that the Lord will lift you up? Even when your father and your mother forsake you, the text says, then the Lord will lift you up. He will not throw away anybody that's connected and that abides in him. It says, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except you abide in me. And so my life is in the vine. As a branch, my source is in the vine. As a branch, my sustenance is in the, in the vine. And as a branch, my success is in the vine. And every time I try to do stuff outside the vine, I mess up. Every time I try to do stuff outside of the vine, it all falls apart. It looks like I'm about to be successful because you still see a little grapes there, but if I disconnect from the vine, all of a sudden the branch at some point is going to shrivel up because I'm not connected to the true vine. I've got to remain connected in order to be successful. And there's this interesting word, this abiding, this remaining that talks about this deep, that seems to allude to this different level of intimacy. If we were using words, uh, perhaps with respect to relationship, we might talk about things like relationship versus fellowship. And so I might have a child that I have relationship with because they're my child. When you ask me on a form, they ask relationship, I will say son or daughter, right? But fellowship is something different. When's the last time you talked to them? 40 years ago. <laughs> so fellowship is different than, and so we can be related, but not in, does that make sense to anybody? Yeah. And so there are a number of people that are actually in the body of Christ, are connected to divine, that are related, but not in, not in fellowship. And this is the difficulty, he says, he that abideth in me and I in him, verse 5, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. And so the interesting thing, verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Verse 8, here it is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love even as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. There's something about not doing what God tells you to do that actually ends up messing up fellowship. It's when the devil wants to stop you from being fruitful and, being pro and, and progressing. He distracts you by things that remove you from fellowship. Sometimes it's just simple enough just to distract you so that you don't spend time you know, doing those things like giving God a telephone call you call it prayer? <laughs> and so God's like, hey, relationship. Yeah, that's my son. Well, I said, talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> Don't even send a text message. <laughs> it's very hard to build really, really good, strong connection without fellowship. And so there's this need for fellowship, but you know what else breaks off fellowship and community? Because distraction can be one of those things. So, you know, distraction, you know, you were, I was going to call you, God, and just as I was about to call you, you're not even that TV show back on Aretha? Oh, Jesus. And I thought it was just one episode, but it was a whole series. Netflix gets you like that. You know, I was watching this show with my wife called Blacklist. I said, she said, I should check, check, check it out. I went, checked it out, and I thought it was just one thing. I was like, oh my goodness, the whole thing, like, look, like, what would happen the next time? We can watch that later. Well, let's get one more episode in there. <laughs> Is that how life happens? Distraction keeps you from really, and we complain, and we get upset. So I just don't feel close to God anymore. I don't know what happened. I don't know. I used to feel such joy. And now it's like, I don't know, it's, I don't know. Well, I know. Something happened in your relationship, in your fellowship, that something began to happen. 
When the enemy wanted to disrupt fellowship with Adam and Eve in the garden, he not only distracted them, but he introduced them to a sinful option. And sin has a way of making you just, you ever do something to somebody, and because you know what you did, they don't even know what you did, but you know what you did, and so when you see them, you feel all awkward, and you just know, and so you stop talking to them, but they, they're like, why so me? They don't even know why. Did I just know? No, you didn't do nothing. Well, talking, no, I'm sorry, I gotta go. I got things I gotta do. The devil tries to get us to sin because he knows that, you know, we all get that awkward thing. And then it's like we start trying to hide that from God. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to be involved, in, you know. It's like, it's a phone call. It's like God come. Why would he call now? I'm in the middle of something. That'd be fun. It's weird because... We call it fun, but how does the sin stuff even happen? I'm trying to help y'all. Trying to help me too. <laughs> how does the sin stuff happen? The enemy doesn't have but so many tools, but you know what he does have? Thoughts, ideas, and suggestions. If you get really good at dealing with them when they're still thoughts, they're much more manageable than when they become suggestions. Anybody? They used to teach us, because you know, you're not supposed to have, you know, bad thoughts. You're not supposed to entertain bad thoughts. But thoughts come. And, it, and my old pastor, he taught me, he said, you know, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head. But you can stop them from building a nest. <laughs> pause, pause, reflect. And so there are thoughts that go through our heads. Like thoughts, thoughts, thoughts. Thought. And if you are diligent in your exercise of spiritual discipline, when those thoughts come, you say, mm -mm, I, that's not a thought from God. I rebuke that thought. And so you got to open your mouth and say it. Don't just be saying it in your head. There's one thought against another. No, you got to open your mouth and get some words to fight against the thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. But I rebuke this thought. I'm not entertaining this thought. You will not take root in me. You will not be planted. You will not make any sort of progress. We will not become friends. Yeah. I will not embrace you, thought. I will not embrace. But when you don't do that, thoughts have a way of connecting with one another. And what was one isolated thought then, there's another isolated thought, and they come together, and connected thoughts become ideas. What's the difference between a thought and idea? A thought is just a disconnected thought. It's a it's, a, it's, a, it's just a building block. But an idea is a plan. Yeah. Right? You know, I have some thoughts, but you know, it takes some work for thoughts to become ideas. What are your thoughts on this? I don't know. Well, I didn't think about this. I thought about that. You know what? With those thoughts, I have an idea. At the thought level, I had no idea how to make it happen. I just had a thought. Like, thought. He said, it was good. On fast day. <laughs> <laughs> thought. There's a pizza shop down the road. <laughs> thought. None of the same stuff around. I would be none of these thoughts. Mm. Thoughts start getting together. You want pizza? There's pizza down the road. I have an idea. While nobody's looking. Go out, get yourself pizza. Don't let them stop you. Don't let them hinder you. Get your pizza. Went from idea to suggestion. Suggestion. Get your pizza. That's what happens to me. I'm sitting there innocently. Pizza, pizza. Talking to the Lord. Pizza, pizza. Talking to the Lord. Somebody probably texted you, William. Sit in my living room. My formal living room where I talk to the Lord. All my books are. You got to set the right environment, right? <laughs> you know, I got a little book. It's like, I think it's like with faith, all things are possible. I'm just surrounded by all this wonderful faith stuff in my formal living room. I'm sitting there, you know, talking to the Lord. I can't sleep. Got all my books out, but you know, it's like, 
Did I feel something back? <laughs> I only got my phone. <laughs> I feel something vibrate. <laughs> and so I can't try to, like, uh-uh, I rebuke this. Again. I'm trying to spend some time with the Lord. We block this time off in my mind. And so no, I'm not going to let the devil distract me with that. You know, you haven't heard from such and such a person in a while. Wonder if they're okay. Like, yeah. <laughs> that might have been them that was buzzing you. You just, you know. <laughs> hey, I have a suggestion. Just go pick up your phone, check it, broke up. Go see if it's blinking. See if it's blinking like green or, you know, or blue. Yeah. See how it's blinking. Check it out. Check real quick. Put the phone back. Excuse me, Lord, just one moment. Because <laughs> that was a good suggestion. <laughs> and so you go and you go to get the phone, and it's like, ain't nobody texts me, but I got some Facebook notifications. <laughs> That's an interesting comment. Let me just give a couple thoughts here, you know, because they could benefit from my wisdom. So, oh, they responded back. And they didn't agree with my wisdom. No, I need to correct this. No. <laughs> but that being said, if you consider X, Y, and Z, you will see the practical reality of A, B, and C. In fact, I have some articles. Let me direct you to this. Where's that article at? Find that article. Yes, as referenced here, that should do it. What if anybody liked what I just posted? Just let <laughs> <laughs> me notice how great that was. I was impressed by that word. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you did. Who is this person that didn't hear what I said? Anyway, who do they think they are? Look on their profile. Scroll through their stuff. <laughs> what else did you post on this group that we're in together? What the crazy stuff did you say? Shouldn't be wasting my time with this person. But you know, I got one more thought I need to share. One more thought. Let me just write this out. So it did get I'm so tired. Look, we'll catch up tomorrow, Lord. You know, I'm sure you understand. <laughs> Isn't it funny you look at yourself in the mirror? <laughs> Keep laughing. <laughs> Isn't that how life is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thoughts, ideas, and what? Suggestions. Because I was, I was doing good about it with him. I was Doing it. I had the time set aside to pray. I was going to pray. I had a good plan in place. But if I am undisciplined in my thoughts, I'll find myself not abiding with him like I'm supposed to. And now when the enemy comes and fights against me, I don't got my shield of faith in place. So what should not have penetrated me, it was never supposed to impact me this way. And I'm not telling you that Facebook is a sin. I'm not telling you that watching movies is a sin. I'm not telling you to go bowling is a sin. Now, when I was coming up, they told us all those things were sin, basically. But I'm telling you, it's your lack of discipline. Yeah. And it's the extent to which you get distracted by it. That's messing us up. And then when the enemy comes to attack us, he knows that our guards and our defenses are down. And what would not have devastated you before, now he sends a little tiny little arrow that gets into a chink in your armor. And now you're depressed for three days. Oh, man. And you can't find out why you're depressed. And you think it's because this person that don't like you did X, Y, Z. No, it's because you were distracted. You were not abiding in the secret place of the Most High God. Abiding on the shadow of the Almighty. Then you would have been your refuge and your fortune. You would have been your shield. And so you're blaming them because you're hurt instead of looking at yourself because you are not properly, properly, properly armored. It wasn't them. 
It was it was me because I was too busy doing other stuff and I did not take the time to have my shield of faith up. And so I'm not seeing manifestation of God in my life the way that I should. It's not that, well, maybe God just don't want to do it for you. That's not what it is. It's because you received the word and you didn't do enough to defend the word that God gave to you. You thought if you just sat there and listened to some nice, good, suggestive message, it would transform you. No, after you get the word, you've got to defend the word that you received. Because the Bible says that when that seed is sown, then comes the enemy to try to steal the word that was invested in you. And in order for it not to be stolen, you've got to put some protection around that word. That means that you've got to put some things around that word that don't allow that word to be taken from you. And so when God says, I'm going to heal you, and that word begins operating in your life, then you've got to defend that word against doubt and against unbelief and against people that will say, is God really? You say, no, I rebuke that thought. The blood of Jesus is against it. If God said I'm going to be here, then I'm going to be here. I believe the report of the Lord. Got to defend the word that you are given. If God is going to give you a job, if God is going to give you employment, you don't just sit there and let the devil spew all this kind of negativity in your mind and in your heart. No, you gird yourself up in the faith. You go find yourself some reinforcement. If God says, I'm going to get a job, you best believe I'll find every scripture I can about provision. Give us this day our daily bread, but my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and what I'm going to burn up the word that I received uh, link it to some other word so that by the time the enemy tries to come back he got to fight against a whole lot more than what he thought he was after you've got to put it all together you got, the same way the devil links his evil thoughts and ideas and suggestions same way you got to link the word of God in your mind you've got to start meditating on it just like the bible says blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of the sinner nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law doth he meditate day and night and he shall be like the tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season and also his leaves shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper sounds a lot like John 15 doesn't it I've got to abide in the word. I've got to meditate on the word. I've got to allow. And you know, here's the thing. You know when you started meditating on the word real good, when biblical thoughts become biblical ideas. And all of a sudden, verses start connecting with each other. And all of a sudden, you start saying, oh, I do believe I'm going to make it. Oh, I do. And all of a sudden, your internal narrative begins to change because it's being fed by these biblical thoughts that the Holy Spirit begins to connect together. And when the enemy comes against you like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. And so I've got to abide in God. I've got to abide in the word, but I've got to be really, really mindful of three things. Thoughts, ideas, and suggestions. Thoughts, ideas, and suggestions that would actually move me away from the things of God. Because it's the, I'm telling you, these thoughts, they be good though. Like, <laughs> And if you entertain thoughts long enough, you lose your ability to, to detect when they're off. You know? And so it's good to have an alarm that goes off, but you always ignore the alarm. And so we had an alarm system in Philly. We lived in inner city. And it was interesting because at first, every time that door opened, it beep, beep, you're like, oh, what's that? What could that be? Who's that? Oh, it's just the wind blowing. Okay. It's like, oh, what's that? Beep, beep, beep. And it's like the boy that cried wolf. At some point, because you don't really do anything as a result of it, you lose your sensitivity to the sound. This makes sense to anybody. And that's why you don't just want to be a hearer of the word. Because you become just a hearer and you don't do anything with it. 
It just becomes beep, beep, and it does not, you become desensitized. This makes sense to anybody. And you become desensitized to the word, and it has no impact or effect on you because you've gotten so used to ignoring it. You know, sort of like, you know, those of us that are married, you know, if you always ignore your wife's telephone calls, you know, not that I do that, but you know. <laughs> I didn't even see my phone ring. You were calling me? You know how kids do, you know? Get so used to ignoring your parents, you don't hear them. You were calling me? I didn't even know you were calling me. God, you were calling me? I did it. I didn't. You losing your voice, Jesus? <laughs> you need a throat loss? <laughs> No, it's not my voice, it's your ears. <laughs> Help my ears. Because he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. But some of us have lost our hearing. We've lost our hearing. Lost our, and it happens so gradually, you don't even realize it. Until one day you realize, somebody asked you the question, so when's the last time you had a real good conversation with God? And you sit there like, hmm. I know, hmm. Hmm. It was, hmm. I don't know where about to start it. I know where we're starting it. Well, let me just work backwards. Let's just work this way. I remember I got saved way right back in 1989. <laughs> <laughs> Lord spoke a lot then. then. Mm. I, 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 you know what it is? I, I was just all the days just blurred together. I, I, just, I know we had a good conversation. I just can't remember it. <laughs> he said some real important stuff, but I have no idea what he said. That's how life happens to us. The devil doesn't like you being close to God because he recognizes that your power is in connection. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. That's a whole different level of living. I got to a point in my life, I'm about to close, I can talk a little bit longer because it's my birthday, I think. Let's see. <laughs> okay, we'll do that one time. So the kind of, the only I know what all time is, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I got to a point in my life, I really did. Started getting nervous. Um, not too much happens in my life that I have not seen. And so therefore, um, I, I can work a job. We'll be sitting at the job and be like, Yes, I'm in the right place. This is good. Because I saw this exact scenario before. And so there are things that I've asked God for. Crazy things I've asked God for. Um, things I've asked God for. And I've seen God do the things that I've asked him for. And, you know, when you're younger, it's like, I know I ain't got until God do all these promises. I got a whole list of promises of God. <laughs> yes. Well, you forgot to do this. Well, you forgot to do this. Then you get, so I got to my age, and I'm like, ooh, he done checked a whole lot of stuff off that list. Like, what next now? And I'm telling you, God has done some ridiculously crazy things for me. I wanted to go to college. My mother will tell you that story. Certainly, God did that. I had other funny stuff I prayed for. I had prayed. Don't y'all laugh at me. I, I remember being a kid. I was an only child. I was like, I was the only child I knew. And so I would pray, like, Lord, I wish I had older siblings. Why is that? <laughs> And then years later, God answered that too. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. <laughs> this press stuff works really good. <laughs> Y'all laughing, but I'm telling the truth. <laughs> Playing my teddy bears by myself. <laughs> My mother said she always thought I had a whole lot of siblings because she would hear me in the room. It's like a whole lot of kids running. I always knew I had a lot of siblings. 
<laughs> so you heard that people pray. Seasons of my life that I saw in advance. And I said, God, now that so many of these dreams have come true, does this mean I'm like that? What's the next phase? Because I don't know what I'm supposed to do now. Because pretty much all the dreams, I mean, things I saw with such specificity and such clarity have now been accomplished and done. So now what? And he said to me, so now what? I said, no, I asked you. <laughs> so now what? He said, no, I'm asking you. <laughs> so, if you abide in me, let my words abide in you. He gave me so much stuff planned out, it was training. So I learned how in this season of my life to know what to happen. He says, from henceforth, I no longer call you servants, but I call you my friend. Y'all read that in the text? There is a place where as you're growing, you're developing, you begin to find, God, what do you want me to do? 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 Et cetera. And then there's a place where God actually calls us to start walking in dominion. To walk as mature sons. Because the earth is waiting for the manifestation of God's mature sons. And sons have inheritance and sons have authority. And he did not give us authority just to be sitting there still acting like we don't know who we are. But now that we're beginning to know who we are, and now that God can trust us, and now that we have some level of maturity, remember what he said to Adam. He's not like Adam. Now here, just do, I have this long list of stuff for you to do. I'm going to treat you like a non-exempt employee, okay? Duty number one, do this. Duty number two, no, do this. He said, no, there's some stuff that you cannot do, but you should know I told you not to do. But other than that, I want you to have dominion and walk in authority. I'm sorry, this is the advanced class. I'm sorry. We can go back to elementary stuff if you want to. <laughs> but the devil doesn't want you to get to that place because in order for the devil to be the lowercase g god of this world, he had to displace Adam. And so in displacing Adam, because Adam actually listened to thoughts, ideas, and suggestions that were negative. And Adam thought that was just about some kind of tree and some fruit and death, whatever that is. And he did not realize that what the devil was trying to get was dominion and authority. Does that make sense? And that's why on, you know, Resurrection Sunday, we get all excited because not, not because Jesus got it from the dead. Not just that. We raised people from the dead before, and that was significant raising also from the dead. And that's kind of impressive. But remember, he, he stopped the funeral. Got the, the guy got up. Lazarus had four days, we got him up. So we've seen him get up before. What's different about him getting up? For one, he got himself up. How do you do that, Magic Trick? But secondly, perhaps more importantly, when he got up, he says, All power is given unto him. In heaven and in earth. He has the keys to death, to hell, and the grave. You know what the significance is? The significance is the authority has been restored back to humanity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he's able to say stuff to us like, yeah, you shall trade upon serpents and scorpions, and none of these things shall my enemies. In my name, you shall cast out devils. You shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Why is this significant? Because when you come out of that worldly system and plug into the vine, the resurrected vine, all of a sudden, all the power, all the authority that's in the name of Jesus, when you get that word in you, and you abide in him, and let him abide in you, all of a sudden, you begin to lay hands on the sick. Jesus says, you know what? Greater work shall you do in my name. Greater works. That's not poetry. It's not entertainment. Oh, that was wonderful. Did you hear that? Pastor said you would do greater works than Jesus. Amen. Let's go back home now. No. He meant what he said. He meant what he said. 
But you know who does not want you doing those greater works? The devil doesn't. And so what does he come to you with? Thoughts, ideas. And you sit here just to myself, oh, this is about sin and going to hell. The devil is so far beyond that, and we are so far beyond that. You have no idea the different level that you're supposed to be living on. But as long as you remain carnally minded, you will never advance to the levels of the spirit that will take you into what God's really trying to show you and do through you. God's trying to show you what it's like to walk in the wind. You're supposed to be one of the sons of God. Beloved, now, not when Jesus comes, not at the rapture, no. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear. What we shall be, but here's the thing. We are sons of God right now. We are partakers of the divine nature from the book of Peter, I believe it is. And so if that be true, then what should my life be looking like in terms of authority, in terms of dominion? Do things happen to me, or do I make things happen? Be careful to answer that question. Because when I was sitting there upset about what they did to me, I came to the realization it wasn't about what they did to me. It was about the fact that what I had not done for myself. Ooh, yeah. and so right. perhaps if we were to take a couple of moments and examine the biblical text again, you would realize that God has given you all the armor that you need to survive and to be successful. He has given you helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness. He's made you pretty much invincible. If you will simply put the armor on. But I know it is you got distracted. And so you woke up and you said, you know, oh, it's Monday morning. Ugh. It's Monday morning. <laughs> and you got up and you said, I'm going to spend Monday morning, you know, just pray a little bit before I get up. Oh, man, that text message again. Who texting me? Let me text them back. I'm hungry. I just started my day. And I never took a moment to put any kind of armor on. Didn't read any kind of verses, no nothing. Somebody came to you, they were a draining person. And I'm already empty as it is. <laughs> now I'm double empty. And now somebody gonna come and get on my nerves on an empty day? This ain't in the world at all. Now I gotta repent. But I ain't in the mood to repent because you know, it ain't coming from my heart right now. I just know I'm supposed to do it, but I ain't even feeling that. <laughs> if you told me to say the words, God, that's fine. But you know, <laughs> I'm feeling some type of way right now. <laughs> Do you hear God speaking to you, people? You don't hear him check your ears just a little bit. God does not need a throat lozenge. <laughs> <laughs> God is speaking to his people today. And don't you ever make this mistake of thinking that God is speaking to y'all and not to me. I'm qualified to speak to y'all because he speaks to me. And the husband is first partaker of the fruit. You know. So I know these stories real good. Some of them might be my stories. Might be. <laughs> might be. <laughs> but it could be yours. I like that better. Oh, but wait, you, you hear what I'm telling you? And it's so much more important than just, did you get your 30 minutes devotional time in today? It's not what it's really about. It's like building marriage, being like, did you get your 20, time, 20 minutes of talking to your husband today? No! It's not about the mechanics. Right? It's about the relationship. It's about the connection. It's about the intimacy. It's not about the, did you get your 20 minutes devotional in with God today? No, it's not about that. If you do 20 minutes, it's still not the intimate head. It's about how you utilize that quality time. It's about how you, it's you got to use that time. You've got to, and you can't, you've got to be present during that time. Right? And so, we try to have quality time, and you look at your cell phone the whole time. It might be difficult for me to want to reveal really deep secret stuff to you. I might think you want to text what I'm talking about and put it on Facebook. I was talking with the Lord, and the Lord spoke. Let me give this to my 5,000 friends. They need to hear this revelation. Like, I'm telling you secrets. Eh? 
Y'all laughing, but I'm telling the truth. And as you advance in God, God begins to share stuff with you that other people are not qualified to hear. The Lord says, we'll do nothing except he reveals the secrets to his prophets. As we that, you know, you're supposed to pray in your secret closet, and there's a whole secret, like, theology that goes around this. You know, when you give me a close the door, and then the Father will see in secret, will, open, will reward you openly. But the problem is that, and, and there are things that you qualify for, right? As you hear God's word and you obey God's word, then you qualify for another level of revelation. And so you actually qualify for levels of revelation, and, and, et cetera, as you progress through obedience. This makes sense to anybody. It's like being in calculus, right? But you got to go through arithmetic and algebra and trigonometry, etc. And you progress through the levels. And now when he speaks calculus to you, you can understand it. Now the problem is that we speak calculus to God in our secret closet, and we're like, mm, this is deep. Ooh, this is great. Let me put this on Facebook so everybody can. And people that know arithmetic are like, I don't know what are you talking about. <laughs> or they run with it and start getting all confused. It's like, well, what's three plus three? Well, the limit of three as it approaches infinity. It's like, what are you talking about? It's six. It's six. <laughs> <laughs> Now, when you say three, do you mean all true integers that include anything that's above 2.5 but less than 3.4? Is that how you're defining three as an integer? Because if you are, then three could actually be 3.4, and if 3.4 and 3.4 are added, that gives you 6.8 rounded to seven. So three plus three equals seven. Ooh. <laughs> That's deep. <laughs> That's so deep. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, that really was deep. <laughs> hey, ooh, that's deep. And I remember sitting there up the deep end on Facebook. It's like, you never qualified for this level. No, you are at 3 plus 3 equals 6. You try to get the deep thing. No, 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 no deep things for you. You didn't even pray this morning. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't read your Bible. You didn't read the. You didn't read the Bible. Advanced calculus, Jesus. No, <laughs> you don't get calculus, Jesus. <laughs> Makes sense to anybody? You gotta have the, the 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 integrity to not allow your desire for praise and recognition and attention to cause you to take things that God has shared with you in secret and publish it to unauthorized ears. That makes sense to anybody. Right? Because everybody's not qualified to hear what God's speaking to you. Some stuff you got to hear and just like Mary did, just ponder all these things in her heart and just receive what God is saying. Church started out so much fun today. We were all praising them. Like, now we're all sitting here like, mm. <laughs> I know I didn't like that guy for some reason. <laughs> all in my business. Me and God were fine and so I got here. <laughs> I was an advanced Christian with my trigonometry. Told us I'm count three Jesus. What's count three Jesus? <laughs> I was doing good. <laughs> Dominion. No, we ain't dumb. I'm supposed to be talking about. <laughs> trying to show you where God's trying to take you. Because if you ever got to see where God was trying to take you, yeah. then you realize how much this stuff is just distraction. Yeah. And like, oh my gosh, it's just little stuff. It's like this light affliction, which endured but for a moment, worketh in us a far more and exceeding eternal weight of glory. The sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared oh with the glory that's here. I'm not, make, I'm not that poetic. These are actually Bible verses. <laughs> you know, give the footnotes to Paul. You know? <laughs> We're not to be compared with the glory that's revealed in us. I have not seen, you have not heard, neither has entered the hearts of men the good things that God has in store or prepared for them that love him. And all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them that are the called, according to, I feel the anointing of God. 
Hallelujah. Somebody give God praise. Really? Hallelujah. 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 The word is working, right? The word is working right now. The word is working right now. I love the word enough to guard it, to keep it, to defend it, to protect it. Protecting the investment of God's word in my heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I'm not going to be distracted and sin this time. That I might not sin against thee. God help me. 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 When you get to this level, you start looking for miracles. That's where I am. I am looking for miracles. I thank God. Can you thank God for this place where we gather today? I thank God. I thank God for opening up this opportunity. It's a miracle we're all gathered here this morning together. Isn't it? Can you thank God for that? I thank God for that. I envision this as a short-term solution. A short-term solution. And I'm asking God to give us something longer term. But I am looking for miracles. I don't think you hear what I'm telling you. I'm looking for miracles. When I say that, I mean crazy stuff. Like, I am, I've been checking my phone, seeing if somebody's trying to call me, not, not during prayer time, but seeing if somebody's trying to call me to ask about a building they want to give us. I'm telling you, I'm looking for, I'm looking for miracles. I'm looking for miracles. I am looking for, if I'm going to bring my petition to God, I expect to get God-sized answers. I am looking for miracles. So I, I don't know how the money adds up. I'm not concerned about that right now. All I know is that if somebody has the building they're supposed to be releasing for us, God help them to find us. If they dial the wrong number and happen to end up calling you, don't you take my $10 million bill. <laughs> you let them know that 10-acre campus belongs to greater bank. If somebody calls you and offers you $50 million, you know that's $5 million of it comes to GF and you keep the rest of it. Pay your tithes. Because God was using as a conduit for a reason. Because he can trust you. Amen. Amen. But that tithe needs to come. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing, but I'm telling the truth. <laughs> no, I'm serious. God can bless either for me or for you. If you can't be trusted, God will just give the money to me. I promise you, He will. Money will just come. Right? And I'll pay my time. But what God might want to do is actually send it through a number of you. And so if God wants to give me a million, He might have to give you 10 million. And if He can trust you to tithe off a dollar, and give 10 cents, then he can trust you with a million, with a 10 million. But if God can't trust you with a dollar to give 10 cents, then you might have to buy a passage. <laughs> <laughs> These principles make that faithful over a few things, he makes you rule over many. That's the principle. Right? You'll be faithful over a few things. When you demonstrate your faithfulness, then God can trust you with more. Right. Amen. And I believe that God is about to trust us with more. I need yeah, God to yeah. move on our behalf. That's right, yeah. Will you agree with me that God is going to take us to exactly where we need to be? It's going to be the right location. We're going to have all the right abilities, everything that we need. We want to take this stuff and put it and put it down. And it's not going to take us 10 years to get there. You know, I'm looking for miracles. Hallelujah. Somebody pray some real quick. I'm looking for miracles. Keep your eyes open. Keep your spiritual eyes open. Looking for miracles, and not only for us collectively, but for those of us individually. If you're looking for something from God, you need something from God to do something specific in your life. Can you rest on your feet? I want to pray with you. If you're looking for God to do something specific in your life, you need God to do something for you. Don't delay. Let's move quickly. Stand if you need God to do something in your life. I'm believing God to do something for me. I'm believing God to do something for me. I'm believing God to do something for me. Don't just stand because it's the popular thing to do. Stand because you're looking for God to do something for you. God, I'm looking for you to do something.
for me. God, I'm looking for you to do something for me. Lift your hands as high as you can. Father, in Jesus' name, these are your people. Come on, begin to pray. Father, these are your people. Father, these are your people. You know them by name. Hallelujah. Every head upon their hair on their head is numbered. God, you know them intimately. God, you know every detail concerning them. And God, their hands are lifted. God, they are acknowledging you. God, they are depending and relying upon you. They know that without you, they can do absolutely nothing. Now, Father, will you do me a favor? Will you hear the petitions that they are asking of you? God, see what they stand in need of. God, see. God, go to the root, O oh God, of every situation, of every circumstance. And Father, perfect that which concerns them in the name of Jesus. Father, you told me to declare to them that if they are abide in you and let your words abide in them. They could ask what they will and it shall be done. Father, I'm standing on your word, not my word. Lord, according to your word and according to your will, let it be done in their lives in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, that they will walk in authority, walk in power, and walk in boldness. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, that no weapon that's formed against them will prosper. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, that every curse in their lives, oh God, will be broken. Father, Father, in Jesus, I pray, God, that blessings will chase them down and overtake them. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, hallelujah, that the goodness of the Lord, hallelujah, they will see in the land of the living. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, hallelujah, that you'll give them authority, oh God, over the powers of darkness, oh God, that are trying to invade, oh God, and trying to ensnare them. Father, in Jesus' name, give them discipline over, oh God, the thoughts, the ideas, and the suggestions of the adversary. Father, in Jesus' name, give them power. Father, in Jesus' name, let the Holy Ghost fall upon as many as hear your word. Father, in Jesus' name, touched by your power, 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 touched by your power. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, God touched by your power. In the name of Jesus, God touched by your power. Somebody say, In the name of Jesus. 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 Somebody give God praise if you can. Hallelujah. Now, come on, give God praise. 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 Come on, give God praise in the name of Jesus. Let come on, let us see you. Let us come on, let us see you. You come on, let us see you. In the name of Jesus. 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 Somebody give him praise. Somebody give him praise. Somebody give him praise. I'm looking for miracles. 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 My father is sending me miracles. My father is giving me miracles. There's a miracle, hallelujah, that the father has for me. I'm looking for miracles. You better protect that word. God has greater, and it's coming greater. It's coming in my life. Greater is coming in my finances. Greater is coming in my family. Greater is coming greater. It's coming in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. 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 Come on, keep praying. I don't play with the Lord because I don't do that. And so this is not prophecy. You talk.